And thanks, Mike and Rowan, for recommending me. The first thing I want to say to you today is that, yes, you have come to a web development conference to hear a talk about EU taxation policy. Please don't run out now. I'm going to do my best to make it somewhat entertaining for you. So who am I? Well, I started creating websites in 1997 when it involved dialing into my university's Unix system to code on the Lynx text browser, which gives you an idea of how old I am. I've been a full-time web designer since 2007 when I went into business for myself, working mainly with charities and not-for-profits in Scotland. But throughout all my work as a web designer, I kept a really keen interest up in the legal issues that impact the web profession, such as accessibility, privacy policies, contracts, terms and conditions, cookies, all of that. I think it's because I started my career in politics, and that's something that stays in your blood. And it turned into an, a, bit of a, a bit of an obsession, really, to the point where I quite unexpectedly went back to university last year and earned a postgraduate certification in internet law and policy. And with that, I decided to hang up my web design mouse and focus exclusively on working on digital law issues for the web profession. That said, I do need to advise you that I am not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer, nor am I an accountant. And nothing that we're going to discuss today should be taken as either legal or financial advice. If you want to keep in touch with me, you can follow me on Twitter at WebDevLaw. My website and blog are at webdevlaw.uk, and there you can also subscribe to my monthly-ish newsletter where I send out regular updates on legal updates you need to know about on issues like data protection, e-commerce, accessibility, the cookie law, laws dealing with UX, anything like that. And just one more disclaimer I want to give you before we start. Obviously, I'm from the UK, so much of my personal experience with Vatmos is from the UK perspective. If you're from the EU, it is absolutely critical that you take the time to investigate how VATMOS has been implemented in your own country through your own national tax authority, because every country in Europe is a little bit different. So what is VATMOS? Well, put simply, it was an EU tax reform designed to crack down on a practice known as jurisdiction shopping. And what does that mean? Well, I'll explain it to you with an example you're probably familiar with, and let's pick on Amazon. It used to be that if you ordered some books from Amazon and they were delivered to you, whether they were ordered from Amazon.de or .fr or wherever, if you took a look at the invoice, the invoice would say that the books had been dispatched from Luxembourg, even though you knew perfectly well they'd actually been sent from a distribution center that was probably 40 miles away from you. The reason that happened was because Amazon can afford to pay lawyers to create some fairly complicated tax structures so that they basically split the transaction into two so that it, the books were sold from Luxembourg but dispatched from your own country. And why is that? Well, because Luxembourg's VAT rate on printed books was something like 1.5%. When the rest of Europe, it's typically between 10% and 20%. And they weren't the only people doing this. All of the big names you can easily think of were engaged in this practice. And governments started realizing that they're missing out on billions, if not trillions, of euros in tax revenues every year because the companies can, that can afford to play these games are playing them. So they decided to do something about it. So they changed the rules for e-commerce in Europe. Now, when you buy an item online in Europe, the tax is not based on where the seller is located. It's based on where the buyer is located. And this is known as the place of supply concept. Taxes due based on the place the goods or service are being supplied to. Now, that's very easy when you're dealing with a box of books from Amazon. It's not so easy when you're talking about digital items, and us, together in this room are an excellent example of that. Let's say you go over to the exhibitors and you're so amazed by a web hosting office offer, you take out your laptop and you sign up for it right then and there. What's your place of supply? It's not Spain. Where is it? That'll depend on a couple of things. Maybe it's where you live. Maybe it's where your business is. Maybe it's where your bank is. What if you're a digital nomad? someone who just travels the world and maybe lives in five different countries every year. What's the place of supply then? That's where things started getting a little bit difficult. Where does this phrase VATMOS come from? Well, 
There's value-added tax, which is the European sales tax. And then they created Moss. Moss means mini one-stop shop. And basically that is the portal that, that the European Union has set up so that you can pay in all these taxes. Because remember now, if you're Amazon, you're not just collecting Luxembourg taxes, you're collecting Swedish tax and German tax and British tax and Irish tax. And you've got to remit them to, that, to those countries. So your options are two things. You can either register with every tax authority in every European country, but because you have a life, what you do is you use the Moss portal, which has been set up in your own country through your own tax authority. So if you're in Germany, you only have to register with the German Moss, and you pay all those taxes you've collected on behalf of other European countries through your own national Moss portal. So that plus moss equals hashtag VAT moss. You'll also see it referred to as hashtag EU VAT, and you'll also see it referred to as hashtag VAT mess, which we will get to. So where did this come from? Well, the discussions about this problem of jurisdiction shopping actually started a long time ago in 2004. And they went on and on, and in 2011, the EU enacted this regulation on the place of supply and you know that EU legislation is very, very slow. It became law in 2011, and then there was two years where all the national tax authorities and all your European countries had to implement it into your own national legislation. So it went to, into the books in your own countries in 2013, and it went live, the law took effect, on the 1st of January, 2015. Now, the problem with that is that all the discussions and news about VATMOS only really trickled down through the accountancy profession and the taxation professions. After all, this is a tax issue, right? Well, that's a problem because absolutely nobody outside the tax and accountancy professions knew about this. The first thing anybody in the web development profession heard about this wasn't until October 2014 when a CMS developer in the UK called Rachel Andrew got a hold of some document about this and did exactly what any of us would do upon finding out about this. She looked at this and just went, uh-oh, no, no way. And she blogged about it and that went viral. And that's how we all found out about VATMOS two months before it went into effect. So what is VATMOS and how do you comply with it? Just please bear with me. And as I'm talking about this, I want you to think about what you would need to do to comply if you are a seller and what you would need to do to comply if you're a web developer. First thing you need to do is determine whether your e-commerce transaction is for an applicable digital service. What falls under VATMOS? VATMOS falls for automated online sales. That's things like MP3s, eBooks, software as a service, themes and extensions, web hosting, analytics, uh, platforms, cloud storage, online advertising, online courses, anything where the purchase and delivery is automated. What wouldn't fall under VATMOS? Well, if an editor contacts me and asks me to write an article for his publication, as he does, and I go off and I do the research and I write the article and I email it to him, that doesn't fall under VATMOS because nothing about it is automated. Does that make sense? So you have to determine whether it's automated or not. Second thing is you have to determine whether the transaction is business to business or business to consumer. VATMOS only does business to consumer. If your customer has a VAT number, which indicates they're a business, you don't have to deal with VATMOS because they deal with that under the chargeback scheme. Then you have to determine the place of supply of the transaction. So if a digital nomad sitting at a conference in Spain buys web hosting to use for his German business, although he's Portuguese, what's the place of supply? We'll talk a little bit about that. And then you have to determine the appropriate VAT rate for the service. By my count, there are currently 78 VAT rates across 28 European member states. There are different VAT rates for ebooks, there's different VAT rates for printed books. You could have a bundle of services or items where there are different VAT rates within the same package. You could have something like, say, you buy antivirus software and it's immediately downloaded, but you also buy a backup CD which is sent to you in the post. VATMOS 
falls on the digital download, but not on the CD. So you can see how complicated this gets. Having done all that, determining the place of supply is achieved by obtaining two pieces of non-contradictory information confirming the place of supply. So how do I determine where you're from if you're Portuguese at a Spanish web conference buying host for your German business? I have to collect various pieces of data about you, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You have to store this data on a secure EU server for 10 years, <laughs> which is a profoundly absurd data retention policy. That's in case you get audited. But think of things you bought online in 2006, and think of those records still living on someone's laptop somewhere. You have to charge and collect the correct VAT, as we talked about, across those 78 VAT rates. And then you have to remit that VAT through your, your tax authority through your national MOS, MOS portal. So you are basically becoming a tax collector for all of Europe. Right, here's the problem. The first was the need to obtain two pieces of non-contradictory information confirming the place of supply. What does the EU consider valid proof? Well, it's things like IP addresses. It could be the country of the location of the bank where you paid from. It was things like, uh, if, it's, if it's a mobile purchase, the registration country of the SIM card on the phone. And it's the seller's obligation to acquire and store this data. Where are you going to get that information from? Using your shopping cart, using PayPal. How does PayPal pass that information to you? How do they collect it? They really genuinely did not understand what information passes between a merchant, a platform, a payment processor, and a customer during an e-commerce transaction. The second real hitch with VATMOS was the requirement to charge and collect the correct VAT. There is no minimum threshold for VATMOS. That means you fall into the system from the first cent of your first sale to another European country. Why is that a problem? Because VAT registration thresholds differ across Europe. There are some European countries where you are put into the VAT system from day one. Other countries have progressively higher VAT thresholds so that startups and new businesses and very small businesses can start trading before they fall into the tax system. The UK has the highest VAT registration threshold in Europe. It's almost it's 80,000 pounds, which is maybe 90,000 euros. And that's to give businesses an opportunity to get started and get on their feet. VAT must remove that. With VAT must, you are into the tax system from day one. So that was how, on the 1st of January 2015, a tax regulation thought up in 2004 to deal with big corporations using tax games to sell physical products became part of the life of every tiny business, self-employed trader, micro-business selling online digital products in Europe. What could possibly go wrong? Well, once we all found out about this law in October 14, two months before it took effect, quite aside from the issues of two correlating pieces of data, there were some screamingly obvious problems about this tax reform. And I could stand up here and rant all day, but I'll just give you a select few. There was a strange presumption, which was probably true when they first started talking about this in 2004, that e-commerce meant e-books and MP3s. The things we deal, deal with, software as a service, plugins, extensions, themes, analytics, cloud storage, crowdfunding. Some of them literally had not heard of crowdfunding, and yet they're passing a regulation that deals with how e-commerce is taxed. There was an equally strange presumption that everyone sells through platforms. They honestly thought we all sell through Amazon. We all go through iTunes. We've got e-commerce developers in here. I've sat through some wonderful presentations on Joomla shopping carts and e-commerce. We've got other platforms, other CMSs, other shopping carts. They had no idea. PayPal buy it now buttons, the very simplest shopping cart you can set up anywhere. They had no idea. They honestly thought we all go through platforms because under VATMOS, the platform is responsible for all this data collection and processing and taxation. So they thought that real people like you and me wouldn't be affected at all. 
we very much were. To me, the most shocking thing was the failure to consult with SMEs, micro-businesses, platforms, and payment processors. It's not just that they didn't consult with them, it's that they didn't even ask if these changes were possible. In the UK, the so-called consultation process for VATMOS was seven small businesses in a focus group. That's not a consultation process. Platforms didn't know about this either. Things like Etsy, eBay, Patreon, who find out through the blogosphere and social buzz that they're expected to rejig all their payment processing systems in two months to comply with the European taxation law. Payment processors didn't know about this. PayPal didn't know about this. The EU tax authority is saying, yeah, on the 1st of January, all you've got to do is push a button and everything will be fine. PayPal had to come out and say, there is no way our systems are going to be ready for the 1st of January 2015 to start passing all this extra data through the APIs we now have to reprogram. There were hilariously wrong estimates of how many businesses would be affected. The UK estimated 34,000 traders would be affected. 95% of the micro businesses of the businesses in the UK qualify as micro businesses. They thought 34,000 traders. Multiply that by maybe 10. As I said, there was no comprehension of the technical burden. Your shopping carts, your APIs, they thought all you got to do is push a button and that's done because that's how it works, right? There was no comprehension of individual compliance costs. We've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence, people talking about how much money they've spent dealing with their accountant and dealing with their e-commerce developers to reprogram everything to become VATMOS compliant. One example is the author Cory Doctorow. I hope you've heard of him. He tweeted that he had to spend 700 pounds in software and accounting fees to rejig his shopping cart to calculate that he owed 18 pounds and 74 pence in VATMOS. And he's a best-selling author who sells a lot of books. Imagine what the technical compliance costs are for someone who has to spend that much and would dream of making sales like Cory Doctorow makes. Those were the problems before implementation. Oh, and there was one more, data protection. If you're collecting information about somebody that includes their name, their address, their IP address, their bank's location, their SIM card, that brings a whole raft of data protection obligations onto you. And remember, you've got to store that information for 10 years on an EU data protection compliance server. Then we moved on to the problems that popped up after implementation. A study found that awareness across the EU of the VATMOS reform was less than 1%. So if you were aware of this law in the first place, you were at a disadvantage because it meant that you had spent time and energy complying with the law, rejigging your shopping carts, paying an accountant, and your competitors were just merrily barreling along having never heard of it at all. There are constantly changing VAT rates. Those 78 rates I talked about, they're always changing. Countries raise them, countries lower them, countries temporarily discount them. Countries raise them and then retroactively apply them to the previous quarter. So that means sellers have an obligation to be constantly monitoring God knows what to keep track of VAT rate changes in Portugal to update their shopping carts. And that places a lot of pressure on e-commerce developers to develop some sort of API to try to pull this data in and hope it updates automatically because at one point the EU's own official page of VAT rates was out of date. We've had interesting evidence of the place of supply rules being applied to the incorrect situations. Is anybody in this room under the age of 18? Good. I had to give some advice to someone I will refer to as an adult performer very professional, who was upset that her customers were being told by the adult platform she performs on that they had to upload a utility bill to prove their address Good. for VATMOS purposes. <laughs> and what's worse is the platform was also charging her and the other performers who use the site VATMOS on their admin fees. So I'm not making this up. I actually looked at the tax table and determined that a live adult webcam entertainment show does not qualify under VATMOS because it is not automated delivery of a digital service. It's on, it's on request. 
So I was able to help the girls get their vat moss refunded from their platform. I am the Tom Joad of strippers. I went to two universities to do that, too. <laughs> Another problem we've seen is tax authorities being burdened with micropayments. The UK's tax authority is not happy at all that 78% of the VATMOS returns they have processed have brought in 1% of the revenue. They, I'm not kidding, they're getting returns for two pounds, three euros, five euros. They don't want to deal with that. They want to go after the corporations for billions. They don't want to deal with someone who was just selling knitting patterns on the side as a hobby and is now legally obliged to report three pounds in vat moss from her hobby. There was a rather bizarre incident last summer where the Irish tax authority actually accidentally sent out 2,000 letters demanding up to 2,000, 2 million euros. You got one? Did you frame it? Yeah. It was, you know, people thought it was a scam or that there, there had been a data breach because you've got this official looking letter from Ireland that's got your tax number on it that says you owe a million and a half pounds when again you paid uh, 50 euro cents to Ireland for the one person who bought your knitting pattern. We've also seen anecdotal evidence of traders being directly contacted by the tax authorities in other countries over discrepancies. There's a Scottish trader who has twice received requests from the Luxembourgish tax authority for top-up payments caused by currency conversions of less than 10 pence. That's maybe, what, seven euro cents? The whole point of the Moss system was that you only had to deal with your own national tax authority. If traders are being directly contacted by other tax authorities over literally pocket change, that sort of defeats the whole purpose. We've seen businesses invoking geo-blocking as an e-commerce strategy. That's when they're deciding, I can't get these two pieces of information, I don't have the money to pay an accountant, so what I'm gonna do is just tweak my shopping cart and shut off all sales outside my country. You can't buy from my shop if you don't come from my country because I can't deal with that loss. And again, that sort of flies in the face of the EU's goal for the single digital market. Then there was the day Patreon made my blog blow up. Um, Patreon is the, the sort of sponsorship platform where people get a monthly fee to do cartooning or drawing or whatever. And they heard about this, that the people who use Patreon, and they were saying, am I obliged to do this? And Patreon told their creators that we're not responsible for Vatmos for two reasons. We're a platform and we're not responsible. And number two, we're an American company, so we don't have to deal with this. They were actually wrong on both counts. Number one, Vatmos means that if you're using a platform, whether it's Patreon, Etsy, eBay, or an adult entertainment platform, they are responsible for all of this. It should not be down to the creators to do this. And number two, if you're doing business in the European Union with European customers, even if you're not located here, you have to be collecting taxes. If you're not, that's tax evasion. And Americans tend to get really agitated about that, but they've already put the same kind of law on the rest of the world. Pot kettle. So I blogged about this and it went viral and that post got nearly 30,000 hits in two days. It was rather hilarious. I kept checking my analytics going <laughs> um, <laughs> So that was how a rule created on paper to rein in the creative tax games played by multinationals was supposed to result in fairer taxation yeah. on paper. In reality, that mess meant the micromanagement of micropayments to microtraders and compliance obligations which were ridiculously disproportionate to the tiny tax revenues raised. But the real tragedy of Vatmos wasn't the administrative hassle. It wasn't about shopping carts or APIs. It was businesses shutting down. It was people giving up before they'd even started, saying, I can't do this, and my choices are to break the law or shut down my business. For 20 years, it's been possible for anybody with an idea or a dream to just get some web hosting, grab a content management system, set up a shop, give it a go, give it a try, get their feet wet, learn the ropes of running the business, and then hopefully be, either be successful enough to join the taxation system later on, or to say, you know what, it's not for me, that's cool. That moss meant for a while that that was no longer possible. 
But just when things were starting to look truly hopeless, something amazing happened. And that was called the EU VAT Action Campaign. This was a group of affected traders just like you and me, self-employed people, micro-businesses, small businesses, hobbyists, who realized that with the best will in the world, they could not comply with this law, that they didn't want to have to have corporate level taxation rep uh, regulations on their tiny, tiny businesses, and that this, business, this regulation was killing businesses before they ever had a chance to get off the ground. They started a Facebook page, they started a blog, they started writing, they started being constructive, they started being positive, they started being inspirational. They didn't moan, they didn't whine, they didn't say, boo-hoo me, they're out to get us. They didn't blame the EU, and despite most of them being British, they didn't moan about, this is why we need to leave the European Union. <laughs> they did it the right way. Now, it's important to remember about these people that they were volunteers. They were not backed by any business organization, group, special interests. In fact, they all put aside their own self-employed businesses, which is to say their own livelihoods, to work on this campaign. They did a job that you would normally expect to see done by a full-time salaried political government liaison officer in an industry body. And they did not get paid for this. They put all this travel to Downing Street, as you can see, on their own credit cards. In fact, when they went to the European Commission, they had to crowdfund. They had to crowdfund to get the airfare. But they kept calm and carried on and they achieved in-person meetings at the highest levels of government. Because most of them were in the UK, they secured a lot of really helpful con concessions for UK businesses, which means that the worst edge is taken off for traders in the UK. They sat down with the head of EU taxation. They sat down with Andrew Zanset. They explained to them, with the best will in the world, we can't pull those two pieces of data. You're putting hobbyists selling knitting patterns on the side into corporate tax regulations. And they just kept at it and kept being positive. And what did they achieve? Well, last month, the EU Taxation Authority announced a plan to establish a VATMOS 3 threshold for startups and micro-businesses. They did it. They also got the EU to agree that in future, VATMOS issues will be dealt with directly through a trader's own national tax authority, which means that the knitting pattern seller in Edinburgh will no longer get emails written in barely legible bad English from the Luxembourg tax authority demanding seven euro cents, 10p, whatever it was. So what's changing about VATMOS? There's good news and bad. The good news is yes, a micro business threshold is coming. The bad news is what's that's going to be. The, uh, the UK wants it as high as 100,000. Italy wants it as low as 5,000. There's some trading to do. So the good news is that threshold is coming. The bad news is at the pace of EU legislation, it's not coming till 2017, 2018 at the earliest. So we've all got to batter through in the interim. The good news is that when it rolls out to physical goods, as it was originally intended to do, it will be much, much easier because you don't have a real dilemma about determining the place of supply of a box. If you send a box from Germany to Spain, the place of supply is Spain. You don't have to go on a magical mystery tour collecting data about the buyer's IP and the SIM card registration where they place the mobile order from. Bad news is, yes, Vatmos is rolling out to physical goods. So if you've not had to rejig your shopping cart to deal with Moss now, you will in future. The good news is some countries have put in interim concessions and relief. The bad news is other countries will permit no changes whatsoever, and that's really down to cultural differences. There are countries like uh, Belgium and Denmark where they feel really strongly that you have an obligation to contribute to society from day one of your tiny startup business, whereas other countries take a more pragmatic approach saying, we don't want to be dealing with two euro tax returns. Really, you're okay. So this is why I said at the beginning, you need to check with your local tax authority in the country where you live. And yes, if you're not from Europe, you do have to investigate your compliance obligations, both for digital and physical goods as they roll out.
Good news is the EU VAT action campaign can put their feet up and get back to their own businesses. They are keeping a watching brief and they will um, snap back to action if we put the Batman symbol in the sky again, if they're needed. Um, bad news is they've really done all they can do within the constraints of how EU policy works. So what has that mess taught us? I think there's some valuable lessons to learn from this whole sorry saga that we can apply to future legislation affecting web development, whether it's a law affecting privacy, data protection, cookies, accessibility, or e-commerce. The first is that bureaucrats genuinely have no idea how e-commerce works. I know we're all just doing our jobs here, but at one point there was a representative of the, uh, the UK tax authority telling a gathering of affected traders that if they didn't want to deal with VATMOS, one way they could get around it was by doing this. They could switch off their shopping carts, accept orders manually through email, and fulfill orders manually by sending the digital product as an attachment out in an email. You're laughing, but this was official tax authority advice. There are people making laws about shopping carts who clearly haven't used one since 1995. You know, bureaucrats, they just, they genuinely don't know how micro business work. They expressed, certainly in the UK, the tax authority expressed astonishment at the existence of people like you and me. My business is wherever I happen to be sitting with this tablet. They've, they're still in the mentality of thinking a small business is 100 people in a factory who are making things and putting them in boxes and shipping them out. The sort of virtual distributed work we do and the complications for taxation and revenue never occurred to them. Sorry seems to be the hardest word. They will not admit they got this wrong. They'll say, we've had a look and we've decided to make some concessions. It would have been nice for them to hold their hands up and say, we called this one badly wrong, but we'll take whatever relief we've already gotten. And we've also learned um, Margaret Mead's quote in action. Never doubt that a small group of th thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. They did it on their own. They nearly lost their businesses, but they did it. But at the end of the day, whose fault is the VAT mess? It wasn't the EU's, it wasn't the accountancy industry. It was us. We brought the VAT mess on ourselves, and I fear that we're going to repeat this problem again if it's not happening already. So why do I think this is going to happen again? We're not an organized industry. We're too tribal. We identify ourselves by CMS, a programming language, or role. Think of the way that doctors and accountants and architects are unified as a profession regardless of their, special, their specialty. We're not like that. For example, we don't have a central organization spotting these problems years in advance. A healthy, organized industry has government relations officers who do nothing but read laws. I read the 183-page text of the European Data Protection Regulation last month. That's not because I have no friends. It's because the time to read it is now, not in 2018, two months before it comes into effect. Because we don't have an organized industry body, we don't liaise with governments during the consultation phase of laws. They did ask about VATMOS. How does this work? How do you need to rejig your shopping cart? We just didn't bother to show up, so we didn't answer. The time to fight the VAT mess was in 2010 when they first started talking about this. The time to fight the VAT mess was in 2013 when it was enacted into all your national legislation. We don't do that, so we end up firefighting bad laws when it's already too late. And I'm not criticizing the work of the EU VAT action campaign for a moment, but they would be the first to tell you this. It should not be up to brilliant, exhausted, unpaid volunteers to take on the burden of fixing these problems when it's too late on behalf of millions of people working in our industry. In a really strange way, I feel we should be grateful for the VAT mess because VAT mess was a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call to change the way we work as an industry with governments on the legislation that affects our craft. And if we don't learn from the mistakes we've made, I fear that all that good work will have been in vain. So how do we break the cycle and change that? Well, we know 
from the success of the campaign that if you play the legislation game the right way, you get results. So we have to stop moaning, we have to stop complaining, we have to stop blaming, we have to stop playing the victim, we have to start organizing, we have to get over ourselves, and we have to start working together. And that starts with you, it starts with all of us, and it starts today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.